When I first moved to New York City, I thought I knew why I was coming here. It was gonna be an adventure. I had my own agenda. I had no idea how much I would fall in love with the kids of the city and how much they would teach me about myself and change my life. I treasure my morning commutes on the subway. It's my time. Sometimes it's my only time with God. In those moments, I know his love for me, and I know that that's gonna carry on throughout my day, and I know it's gonna help me to do my job well. The Bronx is one of the toughest neighborhoods in the country. 75% of the people live below the poverty line, and where there's poverty, of course, there's gonna be violence and sadness and strife, ugliness. Right in the middle of the Bronx is Middle School 223, where I'm a reading and writing teacher to sixth graders. It's where I spend my days every day. A lot of our kids at our school go home to shelters. They go home to homes where they are in charge. They see people get shot in front of their apartment door. Life has not been easy for them or kind to them. Morning. Good morning. Hey guys. Things are coming in quietly. Many of my students haven't been loved well. They've been abandoned. They've been promised things that have never come. They've been promised relationships with their fathers or mothers that have never happened. And so they're just worn. They're weathered and they don't trust love. On the first day of school, the first thing that I tell them is, I've been thinking about you all summer. Like, I love you already. You may not believe this, but you can't earn my love. You could make straight A's all year and have perfect behavior all year, or you can get detention three times a week and I'm gonna love you the same. And then I spend all year trying to prove it. I want you to think back to Monday. We chose that one personal narrative that we're gonna publish and celebrate and put out there to the world. Who am I as a person? What do I really want people to know about who I am? Well, it wasn't until recently that I realized that God had been preparing me for this job, for these kids at the school right now. I grew up in Georgia, mostly at my grandmother's house because my mom and dad were divorced. And then when my dad got married, I felt like I wasn't good enough. He, he wanted me to be perfect. I just wasn't good enough anymore. But I know I don't need other people to say I'm okay anymore. I did that my whole life, and I think I'm finally done. So maybe now I can just be Lindsay, and if I make mistakes, then oh well. I'm not only as good as what I do. Growing up, and especially now, even as an adult, I still long for that love and acceptance, and God has shown that to me and given that to me so that I can go and give these kids the same love and acceptance that they have always wanted, too. Over time, I really do believe this classroom becomes a safe haven for them, a place where they feel accepted, and they know they're going to be safe and it's comfortable. I think God loves these kids so much, more than I could ever hope to love them. But I think he wants them to rest and to be happy. I think he wants to heal their hearts. Every day they walk out of my classroom, and at the end of the year, they walk out of my classroom forever. It's so hard. It's hard not knowing what lies ahead for them or what type of choices they'll make. And I just have to rest. I've done everything I could do. I've loved them the best that I can. And my hope is that they'll figure out that God loves them so much more than I ever could. Uh, in unexpected places, 
in unexpected ways, God is placing illuminators all over the place to spread the gospel of him, to share the light of the life of the glory of Christ. And we're looking at that. So I want you to stand up, everybody, and I want you to illuminate somebody. Look them in the face, look them in the eyes, say good morning, give a high five, a hug, a handshake, and go. Good morning. So good. I, uh, I told Ryan we connected this morning. I was so grateful for last night and for in the middle of the night when I woke up, giving me something to hold on to, to uh, calibrate my mind and anxious thoughts to heaven, to the love of God. Thank you so much. Wasn't that good last night? Yeah, it was great. Um, no, let's not give him a golf clap. Let's just say thank you, Ryan. Uh, I have a secret mission to eradicate golf clapping in church. Let's just go for it, okay? Um, so we're looking at uh, the sub-theme of illuminators. Our theme is face-to-face, and we're looking at uh, how Jesus did it. And yesterday we talked about he found a time, he found a place, he found a location. Now listen, I, I got convicted about something this morning, true story. Um, I'm in a life stage, and I'm wired for early mornings. Um, and so for me, early mornings, it's still a discipline but it's, it's a lot more convenient. There was, a life, there was a time in life stage, you know, we have five daughters, when early mornings, um, it was like living hell, to be truthful, uh, getting up and starting my day. And so my time and place had to shift. And if for you, uh, those seasons shift all the time. And they should shift, because as you grow, your relationship it grows. Uh, I've never had a relationship with Jesus as a 60-year-old. I'll start that in October. Uh, and that will look a lot, maybe a lot different, probably not, but I'll build on it and shift again my time and place. There was a point in time when my time and place was running in a state park. We used to live next to one, and at 5.30 in the morning with a headlamp, I had it all to myself. It was glorious. Can you imagine watching the sunrise? And it was just glorious, uh, but that has shifted. I, I can't run anymore. It'd be a miracle. Uh, so anyway, you do you, your time and place. We saw with Lindsay, her time and place was in her classroom. She got there early. She had her time, her place, her purpose, and that was her time and place. Or on the train. Just find it for you and have you yourself illuminated before the throne of God and then turning to face others to light up the darkness, to get face to face. We'll see today to close the proximity. That's the best way ministry transfers, closing proximity. So let's pray, and we're going to jump into uh, another experience with Jesus. This is a good one, and you know it, but hopefully we can encounter it uh, in a fresh new way. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that uh, we get to be here for the beauty of your creation. Thank you for the exuberance already of just um, orienting ourselves before your throne. And you are so worthy. You are so holy. And you let us in on this kingdom experience. So today, Lord, may your spirit take your word and do a work, a supernatural work in us. Um, as we prayed, open up our eyes, Lord. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, who's good at directions? Okay, everybody stand up. Everybody, this is an all play. It's Christian aerobics, right? Church aerobics, stand up. Okay, when I count to three, I'm gonna ask you to orient yourself towards north, okay? No cheating, okay? Ready? One, and, and you do you, okay? That's the whole point of this. Where is north, okay? Your hand, everyone put out your arm. Your compass. When I say three, go to north. One, two, three, go. Okay, stay, hold it, hold it. Everyone look around. Uh, just, just hold this for a second. This is important. 
Uh, this is so like our culture today, <laughs> right? Uh, I don't know if you know this, we're entering into a national uh, election and we're gonna be thrown at us ideologies of how our north should go as a country. Spiritually, this is like, you know, tons of ideologies of what our north is like. Who is pointing that way? You're the godly ones. You got it right. Everyone sit down. So here's my question for us. Okay, quit talking. I don't have that much time. <laughs> um, my question is this. How do we know without anything who's right, right? With all these cultural and um, even religious ideologies, political ones coming our way, how do we know who's right? In ancient days, before the 16th century, that's when compasses became standard, ancient seafarers looked up into the sky and they would look to a fixed point to a fixed star called Polaris. We know it as the North Star in the sky. Uh, and if you never want to know, like tonight, it's going to be a beautiful night tonight in Zumba. Look up in the sky, find the Big Dipper, and when the handle at the, at the cup, go up from the handle to the Little Dipper, the last star in the Little Dipper, that is Polaris. And seafarers found out how to do that, and they would fix themselves on north and then calibrate from there. Now, in the sun, you know, it rises and sets. Stars do that, too. But this is right above the uh, North Pole. I've got another, well, we got a picture of Polaris. Let's show that one. Next slide, please. Wait for it. Wait for it. Is there another slide? There we go. There's Polaris. Big deal. This is the next one. Go to the next one. Uh, throughout the night, wait for it. There we go. Um, this is what happens in the night in the night sky, but Polaris stays right where it stays. Uh, then uh, we got really smart, we got compasses in the 16th century. And did you know, uh, if you have an iPhone, if you are the godly ones, that on your iPhone, is this on Androids too, or Google phones? There's a compass on your iPhone, did you know that? Right, okay, and that's an easy way of finding out. But did you know that on your compass, your compass isn't actually set to true north? Uh, your compass is set to something called magnetic north. That's how it comes to you when you buy your iPhone. Uh, and magnetic north is different than true north. Magnetic north, under the North Pole, are uh, iron plates, tectonic plates, uh, but they're always shifting. And so magnetic north shifts as well. It's near the North Pole, but it's just a little bit off. So I did my homework, and this morning up there uh, where I had Wi-Fi, I uh, asked the Holy Spirit, I mean, chat GPT, and I said, um, where is magnetic, I live in Mount Hermon, I lied, and I said, uh, where is magnetic north on June 11th, 2000, how many degrees off? It's 13.7 degrees off of the North Pole right now. And you might think, well, that's close enough, right? But then I went back to ChatGPT and I said, if I were to travel using my iPhone towards magnetic north, towards the North Pole, at 13.7 degrees off, how many miles away would I be from the North Pole? And the answer came back, you would miss the North Pole by 200, uh, 862 miles wow. to the east. Now we're talking a big deal. Now, you can go to your iPhone. This is free of charge. This is what Mount Hermon does. It adds value to you. And you can go in your settings, go to your compass, and click that little thing to green, and your, uh, your compass will always be set to true north, not magnetic north. You're welcome. <laughs> now, why are we doing this? What's the big deal, you say? It's just 13 degrees. Uh, if I could put that into our face-to-face -face, uh, uh, setting, uh, Jesus is true north. John 14, 6, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. He saw when sin entered the world, uh, it had a magnetic pull that pulled us away from true north. And friends, it has wreaked havoc in our world. And we'll see this on Friday. This is not the world God created. This is the world we messed up that we're living in. And that magnetic pull affects everything. And he came and walked the earth to show us in living, breathing 3D how to live true north. And one of the reasons why uh, on a, I try on the daily to meet with Jesus is that recalibration 
on a regular basis. And that's not the only time. Jesus said before he left the planet, it's to your advantage I'm going away. I'm going to put a true north power source in you called my Holy Spirit. And whenever that magnetic pull comes, if you open yourself up to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I will realign you and recalibrate you throughout your day. We call that conviction. Uh, and so uh, there are tons of forces pulling us away. Can any of you sense or do you relate to the magnetic spiritual forces pulling you away from true north? Now, look, they're probably not or don't want, uh, they do want, but they probably won't ruin your spiritual life, make you deny Christ, some people, sadly. But it's just a 13.8 degree off, and that's enough to ruin your witness. That's enough to make people go, that's why I'm not a Christian. Uh, it's wreaking havoc. I, I just thought of magnetic pools in me, magnetic pools around me. Uh, comfort's a magnetic pool for me. Uh, many times when I sense what God's calling me to do, uh, I'm, it's just uncomfortable, and I don't want to step out of the realm of comfort. Uh, my emotions can be a magnetic pull when I have them disordered and allow myself to let them be my authority, not the word of God. Um, spiritual forces, it's bad enough there's cultural forces. We'll see this on Friday. There are, there's a whole demonic realm, hell-bent, to, to get after our heart, and it makes us... Uh, exchange our identity for what I call lie identities. Lie identities. We see ourselves differently than God does. Uh, disordered allegiances. You'll see this in the coming months. I pray for me. I pray that the church in these coming months would maintain their kingdom allegiance as a priority over their political preferences. It would, and this is so radical in the church today. It decimated us four years ago that we would, actually, we would actually surrender our political preferences for our kingdom allegiance. We keep our political ideologies ordered. You know what's another one? This is right where, you know, Ann and I live in the northern border of Silicon Valley. Affluence. Affluence. It, it affects our prayer life. I mean, I was, you know, we spent a lot of time in the Congo, and, and over there, you know, they pray for safety. You know why? because there's actually terrible things that happen in the Congo. And when I think of praying for safety, many times I don't need to. I just put my lock on. I turn on the alarm. Affluence affects our us. Busyness is a magnetic pull. I can go on and on. I'm just confessing to you. Do you forgive me? Like, it's, you know, our peers, inside and outside the church, the culture of your church, the temperature of your church, its passion for Jesus, and you and I looking around and wanting to fit in, that's a magnetic pull. Why not just make it about you and Jesus, and you set the temperature as opposed to reflecting the temperature? This magnetism, it's a big deal. Uh, but we don't need to be afraid or cautious because, well, we do need to be cautious but not afraid because Jesus came in the world and he gave us his spirit, left it with us, him with us, so that we could have this, this draw the true north again and again and again. Not only the draw, but the power source. All that leads us, it's a big introduction. Are you still with me? Okay, to John chapter three. Turn to John chapter three and John chapter four. We're gonna go in John chapter four and hang out there and look at that face-to-face -face encounter with the Samaritan women. But I need to give you a little bit of context. John intentionally does a few things in his gospel. The first thing he does is he's always contrasting light and darkness. You'll see that imagery throughout John. It's, it's a great imagery and we see it here for sure. Uh, and then in John chapter three, uh, we see two people, John three and John four, coming face to face with Jesus. Uh, and they realize both of them have been magnetically pulled away from him. N uh, not a lot on the surface, uh, but when you talk to Jesus, you realize, yeah, you may just be 13 degrees off, but you're hundreds of miles away from the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God goes after them. On the surface, these two couldn't be more opposite. Opposite. Their lives, their lifestyles, their worlds apart, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. But here's the deal. Uh, making our priorities and value system based on the surface, that's a magnetic pull. You were never meant to do that. Nowhere in scripture does it talk about that. Um, none of our core problems are on the surface. They're all out of the heart. Jesus said that in Matthew 15. 
And while these two individuals couldn't be more different on the surface, because one is a moral, socially prestigious insider, that would be Nicodemus, the other's a moral, social, and ethnic outsider, that's who we're going to look at, the Samaritan woman, both hearts needed to be transformed. Both hearts needed an experience with Jesus. All of us will find us on the surface, morally, somewhere between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. But John is all about light and darkness and in the heart. All of us can identify with their heart issues. And that's where we're going. He's with Nicodemus, and Jesus is actually surprised. In John 3.10, it's not on the screen, but look there in your Bibles. He says, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? When did Jesus and Nicodemus have their conversation? At night. That's intentional for Jesus and John. And Jesus is going, wait a second, you're supposed to be one of the shepherds of my people and you don't get this? He's blown away. And then we come to John 4 and into Samaria. And, and I just need to tell you this and we're gonna jump in. There are invisible lines in the sand in this story, unknown to most of us, but well-known to John's original readers and well-known to Jesus and his disciples. Oh, there's cultural lines. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Um, I, you know, apart from the weaponry and the savage ways being lived out today, Hamas in Israel would not be a far-stretched illustration for Jews and Samaritans. Um, there were religious lines. The Jews thought the Samaritans were, had, had compromised, and they thought if we interact with them, we will be compromised. Remember we talked about the garbage thing yesterday? There were ethnic lines. There were gender lines. Uh, men shouldn't have instigated with women. And what I love about Jesus is that with all these dramatic lines in the sand, he's not afraid to cross the line. <laughs> Praise God for that. And we shouldn't be either. Because proximity is so important. We all have lines. It could be the border of your comfort, like I talked about. It could be not wanting to cross the street. It could not want to be to cross the town to the other side of town or interact with certain type of people. Everyone, look right here. Cross the lines. We're playing it way too safe as a church. And, and it's wreaking havoc in our own spiritual life and even in the kingdom of God. I told you about uh, on Pentecost Sunday, three Sundays ago, um, in our state, historical. We've never had that many baptisms on one day in the state of California. You know why that happened? Because people, ordinary people like you and me, crossed some lines in the power of the Holy Spirit and loved people, saw them face to face. Crossed some lines. Lindsay crossed lines. We saw that today. Becoming a teacher in Brooklyn. Dion, yesterday, crossed lines. I wonder where, and it might be worth writing down and reflecting on today, where's the Holy Spirit prompting you to get out of your comfort zone and cross some lines and get face-to-face -face with people? So when you do that, I want to give you a playbook for how to do that. Now we're in John 4. All that was the longest intro in the world. Here we go. Uh, John 4, uh, and here's the first thing I want you to know in the playbook. Face-to-face -face moments are providential. Here's what I want you to know. If the Holy Spirit's leading you to cross a line, God will go before you and create what's called divine appointments. It says in John 4, verse 3, so he left Judea and went back to, uh, once more to Galilee. Now he had to go to Samaria. Most Jews, the trade route was around Samaria because they didn't want to get near Samaria. But Jesus is like, I'm going to cross the line because he's the savior of the world. And heaven wouldn't be complete, the kingdom wouldn't be complete without Samaritans in it. So he came to a town called Samaria, uh, a town in Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground Jacob, this is all very important, had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was for the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Centuries before, most of the Jews, and this is where a little history on Samaria, were exiled as Babylons to Persia. You know that story in the Old Testament, right? Tons of books were written around there. The book of Esther, book of Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, when they came back from that. Jews were ransacked 
and taken to Babylon. Some of the Jews stayed behind and intermarried with the invading army, the Canaanites, and essentially, essentially formed a new ethnic group called Samaritans. And the Samaritans took part Jewish religion and part Canaanite pagan religion. And they created uh, this, uh, theologians call it the synchronism, uh, where they had their own temple on Mount Gerizim. We'll see that come out. Uh, which, by the way, the Jews in 120 B.C., completely ransacked the temple. They invaded Samaria and decimated the temple. Um, they had their own way of worship. They created their own, uh, their own savior. Uh, they were racially inferior, religiously heret heretical, political sellouts. Jews hated Samaritans. They wouldn't go near there. And Jesus is tired. That's amazing in the story. Literally, the, the word says he's exhausted. He's hungry and he's thirsty. Just stop for a minute and think about that. The God who said, let there be light, the God who is at creation is tired on this earth. Talk about humility. He's hungry. And Jesus goes by a well and he's doing what he always does, what he loves to do. He's acting providentially. Let me unpack that word. This is really important. This will change your outlook on your day if you really believe this. Providentially. Uh, pro means it's Latin for forward. Vide is Latin to see. The word providentially is it's a theological term of God seeing ahead of time and working things out for you to walk into. Our God is a God of providence. See, we see our life linearly. Like I can look to the future dimly. I can see the past pretty clearly. God looks at your whole life at one time. Not only your whole life, but the billions of people on the planet. I don't even understand this fully. And he's constantly working things out for his good. If we'll walk into him, those good works, providentially. Uh, one theologian, one commentary said, providence is the hand of God in the glove of time. I love that. Jesus had to go to Samaria, and he had to get there by noon. Why? Because he knew there was a woman who was so ashamed, even in her own community, she couldn't draw water when everyone else did. She didn't want anyone to interact with her because she was so ashamed. She would come to the well. He had to go there to get face-to-face -face with this one woman. A great verse on providence, there's tons of them. It could be a whole message. It could be a whole conference. Psalm 139, verse 16. Uh, David said, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. In other words, before God said, let there be light, he knew and said, let there be Gary. And let him be born in San Francisco in 1964. And let his parents move to Nevada when he's three months old. And let them enroll him in parochial schools. And because I've got a plan for him, let me have him uh, study and learn under the best uh, that the Catholic Church has to offer. I had such great role models. Not everybody, but great role models as priests and nuns. They taught me to fear God. And in his freshman year at Sac State, let someone come up to him and ask him, do you want to know God personally? And let him get involved in this community called Campus Crusade for Christ. And let him get around people who will put up with his stupidity and offensive language and offensive behavior and just pray for him and love him. And then on Halloween night, let him walk into a fraternity party to break Ten Commandments and let me break through and say, no, you're mine. It's time to come to me. I can go on and on and on, but that's what that verse means. And when you hold the providence, now we also have a free will. I'm not discounting that. We are not robots in the kingdom. I used to do the robot really good, everybody. Uh, we're not robots in the kingdom of God. We have a free will. But when you believe that, your days, when you're illuminated by the Holy Spirit and sourced to calibrate the true north, there's divine appointments all the time that take place. And you don't always see the results of them. But you just know I'm being used by God to plant seeds, to water, or sometimes to see them come to fruition. Uh, a couple years ago, actually it was about a decade ago, I was in Omaha, Nebraska, and I was doing the wedding for a very good friend of mine, his son. 
And we did the rehearsal, and because he's on staff with crew at uh, Campus Crusade, and he's overseas, and we hadn't seen each other after the rehearsal dinner in the hotel we were staying in, I said, let's go get dessert. Let's just catch up. And Matt and I were there. This hotel was just opening, and uh, our waitress came, and we were the only people in the hotel. And we only picked it because it was convenience, but God providentially had us there. So we saw our waitress come to us. She was younger, and, and you could just tell she had a rough life. Uh, you could just tell by um, not her physical scars, but her emotional scars, the way she wasn't an illuminator. Let's just put it like that. And, and the messages on her body weren't messages of life. And so, you know, I have a practice of asking someone their name because it's just trying to make it personal. Again, just being kind. It's a great apologetic in this day. And she was short. What's your name? She tells me her name. My name's Caitlin. Great. I'm Gary. This is Matt. Thank you for serving us. Yeah, what's your order? I'm like, whoa, okay. And so we gave her our order. And then she went. And she's coming back. She gives it to us. And then she leaves. And I, I just said, Matt, like, um, we got to pray. I'm so thankful to be with you. And so we just bowed our heads and gave thanks. And as Caitlin's coming back, she goes, she interrupts us. She didn't know we were praying. She had no concept of that. And she goes, um, did you guys lose something? Because our, our heads were down. <laughs> I said, oh, no, we're, we're just giving thanks to God. Like, we haven't seen each other, and we have such a great history. I wanted to thank God. And she said, oh, are you guys religious? Like, and that wasn't a curious question. I said, no, we're not. And immediately she says, that's good, because I hate church. I go, wow, I'm a pastor. Tell me more. <laughs> and she goes, I thought you weren't religious. I'm like, I'm not. I tried that, promise me. 12 years of my life. Um, but I have a relationship with Jesus. She goes, well, what kind of church do you pastor? That's a good question. I just got asked that question uh, two days ago by our Airbnb guest. And I said, um, it's a church that pursues Jesus and doesn't like religion. And she left. She didn't say a word and left. And that night, she kept coming back, and as she was serving us, just would ask a question but not stay for the answer. She was just revealing her heart, everybody. So as we were getting ready to leave, I stopped. I said, Caitlin, um, look, I want to leave you with a couple things. And I gave her my email. I said, if you ever have questions about Jesus, email me. And I gave her a website, imsecond.com. I am Second is a tremendous portal filled with four to eight to ten minute videos of people from all walks of life who've given their life to Christ. It's just filled with testimonies. And I said, don't take my word for it. And you can actually enter in um, subjects. You can enter in abuse. You can enter in uh, football player. You can enter in uh, female track athlete. And if they have it, that story will come up. And then I left her a big tip. And then we left. And I thought, wow, I, didn't, I actually didn't think about it ever again. Well, two months later, in my inbox comes this email. Hello, my name is Caitlin Kelch. I work at the Flatwater Bistro in Lincoln, Nebraska. I met you one night before a wedding that you were going to be attending. And I just thought so I'd let you know. I recently gave my life to Jesus, and I'm attending a church. I would love it if I'd hear back from you. And I wrote her back, and I said, Caitlin, of course I remember you. What wonderful news. If there's anything I can do to help you grow in Christ, please don't hesitate to ask. You're in a great church. I went to her church's website. Thanks so much for the email. It encourages me in faith. I'm praying for you. And then she wrote back that same day. This is all happening in the same day. To be honest, I'm not really sure what I need. I'm just reading my Bible. I can't get enough of it. But I thought I'd let you know, and I thought you would enjoy, that your being a disciple has made other disciples. That's providence. Now look, I don't have a life full of those stories. I've got like a dozen, and it's not because I'm special. 
It's just because I'm willing. And it's because I try to calibrate my life to true north. And it's because I have a deep conviction. I'm a Sunday, used to be, I'm not anymore, but my profession was Sundays. But I believe the kingdom of God, the conviction, is advancing in unexpected places, in unexpected ways through people like you. But I also know there's magnetic forces pulling you away from believing that or being bold. And so we're all here to learn how to calibrate to true north. The first tool in your playbook is to understand face-to-face moments are providential. Now we got to hurry. Face-to-face moments are personal. Listen, Jesus loves the world, but he also knows your name. And he knew Caitlin's name. And that's the beauty of the, and he knew our name. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Now, now again, can we just worship for 30 seconds? This is the God who two chapters earlier turned water into wine. He could have filled the well with wine and said, hey, go get some water and just go, this is going to be so good. He could have smacked the well and water come out. That's what Moses did. But he's humbling himself. And coming to her in his weakness, not in his strength. There's something there for those of us who want to get face-to-face with people. Don't come as a superhero. Go in your weakness because it glorifies God. I I don't have time to get into it. uh, And I'm sorry, that's on me. I've mismanaged this message. But um, there's something Jesus is playing into, and that is Old Testament betrothal scenes. Uh, I'll give you, you look for yourself, but in the Old Testament, uh, at least three times more, at wells, Old Testament heroes went to find their wives. Uh, Abraham's servant stopped at a well, met Rebekah there in Genesis 24. Jacob, this is Jacob's well. At this very well, Jacob met Rachel when she came to get water. Moses met his future wife, Zipporah, guess where? At a well. In this story at Jacob's well, Jesus is intentionally lining up. You can't make this up. People who go like, oh, the Old Testament was written, or the Bible was written by people. I'm like, you, we're not that smart. <laughs> Jesus is going to the very well where Jacob found his wife, to a well where Moses found a wife, to a well where Abraham found a wife, and he's redeeming the well narrative for the new bride of Christ. Who's that? Us. This is amazing to me. He goes to a faraway homeland, much like Jacob did and like uh, Abraham did, like Moses did. Uh, And in each case, he pulls from each story. Um, I'm just going to take a minute. Uh, Forgive me, okay? Okay, okay. Um, uh, Just in the story of, let's just go one by one. As Isaac, Jacob, and Moses included camels and flocks that needed to be watered, this woman's town, Sychar, they needed living water. Uh, Just as in Isaac's story, when Jesus sat by a well, he meets a woman and asks her for a drink. Isaac did the same thing. She questions his request. That's what happened to Isaac. And he, like Jacob, offers her a drink. And just as in Moses, when he arrived at a well and delivered the daughters of Jethro from their harassers, you read the story in Genesis 24 yourself. Just as Moses did that, Jesus will deliver this woman from harassers in her village and her husband's or old husband's. She's shocked that Jesus would talk to her. Verse nine, the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Implied, don't you know the rules? Don't you know the rules? You know, we're gonna go to the next point, but what I want you to see here is in the playbook, you gotta cross the lines and get personal. You gotta ask them their names. You gotta know their stories. You have to share your story. Don't keep your neighbors on your front porch. Bring them into your living room. Bring them into your dining room. Bring them to your kitchen table. So he gets really personal with her. She's sharing her story with him. And the next thing I want you to know in verse 16, face-to-face moments are piercing, are piercing. Jesus already tells her, he's like, oh, do I have water for you you know nothing of? She's like, I want that. And now comes the tough part. 
the piercing part. The gospel is this, and I quote Tim Keller, who is a pastor theologian out of uh, New York City. He's with the Lord now. But he's got this great line. This is the gospel. You are loved by God more than you ever could have imagined, and you are more broken in sin than you ever would realize. Both are the gospel. And so he's gotten to her and tell her, I have something for you that's so good. She's like, I want that. He's like, yeah, I know you do, but now we got to get to the tough stuff. And we do too as we're sharing the gospel. Not to condemn. Remember, he came to her in humility, but to, to point it out to heal. Uh, my wife taught me something really amazing as she raised our girls, as we raised our girls. She said, what God brings to the light, he wants to heal. What God brings to the light, he wants to heal. And that's the truth with God, too. He'll expose things not to condemn you, but to heal you. Verse 16, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. I, I would love to hear the inflection in her voice when she said that. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and Read this through the heart of love. And the man you have now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. See, he's exposing the pain so he can heal it. But healing doesn't happen until she realizes it needs healing. You can't come to Christ apart from knowing you're broken. And I know, and we have prayed for every person at camp this week. Some of you are here, and I don't say this in any way. I, I say this only out of gratitude, that you're here, but you're figuring out this Jesus thing. You are so welcome here, and I hope you understand at Mount Hermon, you don't have to believe in order to belong, that you can be part of the Mount Hermon community and see how Christians one another, one another, and listen to the messages, but I would just invite you to look at yourself is everything okay? Are you really living your best life? Do you really think you were designed to live only at this level of life? Isn't there more to life than you're experiencing? Can you acknowledge your brokenness? It's the first step to coming to Jesus. He loves you so much that he wants to make you whole. And he's brought you here. He's crossing the line coming to you saying, come home, come to life. Last point, face-to-face -face moments are powerful, are powerful. The beauty as we get face-to-face -face with people is we don't go alone, and we don't do this for Jesus, we do this with Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing. And he does the heavy lifting. We just get in on the family business, <laughs> Uh, I know that because I worked for, in the family business. My dad had a poultry company, chickens, turkeys, Cornish game hens. We even had a line of um, quail. Mm. Too much bones, not enough meat. Anyway, I, di I diverged. I was destined to become the chicken king of the Bay Area. Did you know that? <laughs> but God had a different calling for me. And I know what it was like to grow up in the family business, and I loved it. I loved that my dad was the boss. I loved that my dad was in charge. I loved it. And now I'm still in the family business for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he empowers me and you to do what we do. Verse 25, the woman said, I know Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. She's looking for Messiah. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm going to give you the literal Greek uh, grammatical translation. Here's what he said. I am the one speaking. Remember back in Exodus 3 when Moses asked God, what's your name? And what did God say? I am. This is the first time in the book of John that Jesus reveals himself as God. And he didn't do it to Nicodemus in chapter three. He crossed a number of lines. We talked about them, gender lines, cultural lines, religious lines, political lines, to meet with a woman that was a throwaway in the town. This should inform our ministry. And he said, I got news for you. I'm God. 
And I've come to this well to empower you to be my ambassador to your village. Uh, in The Chosen, I don't know what you think of that. We love The Chosen. Uh, episode, uh, the last episode in chapter two, it's this very story. And when Jesus, right after this moment, she just starts getting giddy. It's beautiful. I really, you can just go to the, uh, YouTube or go to The Chosen app. And she's like, I gotta go tell the town in, uh, in The Chosen. This is fiction, but Jesus, I believe it was implied. He's like, I was counting on that. And she goes running. Uh, it should blow your mind that Jesus didn't go to Nicodemus and reveal himself. That he goes to the outcast and reveals himself. And his power transforms her life. Where she was running away from the village, now she's going to run to the village. Where no one would have believed her, let's see what happens. They Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And this is what you have to ask. Why? What was it about her that made them believe her? She had been so, this is my theory, so illuminated, they couldn't refute it. And they wanted it too. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. We've heard for ourselves. And we really know, John already, he's got 21 chapters in his gospel, and he didn't do the chapter. That came hundreds of years later. But at the start of his gospel, he says this, and we know that this man really is what? The savior of the world. The savior of the world. We gotta land the plane. You've got your playbook. We talked about True North. We talked about being an illuminator. We've already seen this week from Dion, from Lindsay, ordinary people illuminating their world. It was an ordinary day, but when she left that well, her life was totally revolutionized. She'd met Jesus. And when she ran away from the well, she became in that moment one of the most famous people in all of history. So famous that halfway around the world from that point, thousands of years later, hundreds of people are gathered talking about her. It's amazing. And I want you to know Jesus can do that through you. If he can use a Samaritan woman like that, he can use me. He gives me hope. He can use you. You have a playbook. Let me give you one tool. Uh, there's a tool called uh, blesseveryhome.com. I was actually talking to Ryan about that. Um, Google that, okay? Um, I learned the blessed strategy. The, the pastor is here who taught me the blessed strategy. She used to be in charge of evangelism for our whole denomination. Bless is an acronym. Uh, I've morphed it to sound like this. Uh, this is how I say it. Begin with prayer. Uh, listen with care. Eat together. Serve your way into people's hearts. Share your story. It, it's a simple way to show up and illuminate. Begin with prayer. Uh, in those times with Jesus in my chair, I go around my neighborhood. I told the Lord, I can't reach the world. It's way too big for me. But take Grand Street, that's where we live, between Hopkins and Brewster, 25 homes, take it off your list. Together we'll do that. I'll be faithful here. We've been living there 11 years. We've tried to be faithful. And every day I pray for those homes by name every day. And then I walk through the strategy. I pray for those providential divine appointments. It's amazing what happens when you do that. And how you know people are out on their driveway and you just run into them walking your dog. And they share something. And then I used to have to take notes about it. But with blesseveryhome.com, someone in Kansas City, a billionaire, invested tens of millions of dollars into a database where you enter in your address, it populates your neighborhood by name. And since I've been doing this, we've had two neighbors move. Their new names, once the neighbors moved in a month later, their names were on my blessed list. And so every day I get an email with a scripture verse. We're going through Colossians right now. And it gives me a verse to pray over my neighbors, and then it gives me their names. 
and I just do five at a time so that every week I'm praying through my whole neighborhood. And then when something happens, I can go into my database. Uh, our next door neighbor, we had a blackout. Why? With all the money we're spending on PG&E, can I not have electricity for 72 hours? I don't know. But there was a blackout, and so we thought of the two widows that lived next door to us, and I went over, I'm like, are you okay? Do you need lights? What do you need? Battery generator, da, da, da. And in giving them portable lights, they shared some of their story. We noted that, and we pray into that. Um, this fall, we had a bunch of our neighbors in our home for seven weeks doing an exploratory thing. It, it, it's like, it's like it, they gamified it. I know it's no game. We're talking about eternity, heaven, and hell, but it's made it so uh, accessible for us, for me, to pray through our neighborhood and to see God do great things. You've got your playbook. You've got your tool. Let me pray. I've got 25 seconds, and so let me pray. It's awesome. Jesus, thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray uh, right now that you today would uh, awaken us to where we're uh, uncalibrated to true north. We open ourselves up to you, Holy Spirit, to speak to our lives and align our lives. And then I pray, Lord, uh, for those you put us in proximity to, where we work, play, learn, uh, and live. And Lord, open our heart, break our heart, and let us build proximity and use us to illuminate to get face-to-face. -face. We love you, and we thank you. And all God's people said, amen. amen.